The Meaning of Marxism by Paul D'Amato Biological Determinism You Can't Change Human Nature There is another kind of materialism that Marxism rejects outright, and that is the biological or genetic materialism that presents human behavior as determined either solely or primarily by our genetic inheritance. This line of reasoning, which goes back to such social Darwinists of the late 19th century as Sir Francis Galton and Herbert Spencer, presents us with the argument that human nature is the fixed and unchanging result of our biological makeup. Why do people behave the way they do? It's part of our genetic coding. Greed, selfishness, xenophobia, racism, male domination, violence, and war are all attributed to something innate to all of us. Needless to say, this is a very convenient argument for someone who is trying to uphold the status quo, for it places the blame for all sorts of nasty behavior on human traits that are beyond anyone's power to change. The early advocates of social Darwinism, which could be summarized as survival of the whitest and the richest, were blatant in their racism and disdain for the poor. In addition to arguing that white Anglo-Saxons were superior to the dark-skinned people of the world, Spencer also opposed universal education, free lunches for the indigent, and any laws regulating wages or working conditions. These ideas went into decline briefly after the rise of Hitler, but began to revive in various forms starting in the 1960s, and culminated in the publication of The Bell Curve in 1994. In addition to arguing that people rise to the top of society because they are intelligent, an attribute that they said was primarily based on genetic inheritance, the authors unabashedly argued that blacks were inherently less intelligent than whites. The late Stephen Jay Gould rightly noted that these purportedly scientific ideas are ideology, not science, providing the justification for various right-wing policy initiatives that attack the poor and the oppressed. Why struggle and spend to raise the unboostable IQ of races or social classes at the bottom of the economic ladder, he wrote. Quote, Better simply to accept nature's unfortunate dictates and save a passel of federal funds. We can then more easily sustain tax breaks for the wealthy. Why bother yourself about underrepresentation of disadvantaged groups in your honored and remunerative ballywick? If such absence records the diminished records the diminished ability or gen general immorality, biologically imposed, of most members in the rejected group, and not the legacy or current reality of social prejudice. End quote. The argument that our behavior is based on evolved genetic traits was presented most systematically by sociobiologist E. O. Wilson in the 1970s, and has since been widely accepted. Quote, the most distinctive human qualities have emerged during the phase of social evolution that occurred through intertribal warfare and through genocide, Wilson asserted. Quote, Among general social traits in human beings are aggressive dominant systems with males dominant over females. End quote. Richard Lewontin another Harvard geneticist, calls sociobiology the latest and most mystified attempt to convince people that human life is pretty much what it has to be, and perhaps even ought to be. The method of sociobiology is to look around at the world as it is, our capitalist world, and from that distill a set of fundamental human traits that it claims apply 
to all human beings throughout history. These claimed universal traits, according to sociobiology, male dominance, hatred of strangers, systems of domination, competition for resources, even a hankering for religion, have their origin in our genes. The modern incarnation of sociobiology, evolutionary psychology, claims that human beings possess genetically programmed behavior that developed over a long period of time in the Paleolithic era. But as biologist Stephen Rose points out in an argument that also applies to Wilson, quote, the descriptions that evolutionary psychology offers of what human hunter-gatherer societies were like read little better than just-so accounts, rather like those museum and cartoon montages of hunter-dad bringing home the meat while gatherer mom tends the fireplace and kids. There is a circularity about reading this version of the present into the past, and then claiming that this imagined past explains the present. End quote. These fashionable ideas, though continually offered as fact, have no scientific foundation. Search as they may, biologists will never find a war gene, because war isn't innate to humans any more than pacifism is. It's not that there is no biological basis for our behavior. But for every example of aggression in human behavior, we can also find examples of peaceful cooperation and sharing. Moreover, how these things are even defined depends on the historical and cultural setting. Neither violence nor sharing are genetically programmed. They are socially shaped and conditioned. As the evolutionary biologist Theodosius Dobzanowski wrote, Heredity does determine that a person can learn to speak a language or languages, but it does not determine which language he will learn or what he will say. If there is a fixed human nature, then how can it be that human societies have differed so much between different regions and historical times? How is it that some societies were egalitarian, sharing societies, while others were competitive and class-divided? How is it that some were warlike and violent, while others were relatively peaceful? How is it that some accorded women a high position, and others a subordinate one? The French Jesuit missionary, Lejeune, who lived among the Montagne Nascapi Indians on the Labrador coast of Canada in the early 1630s, for example, complained of them, quote, as they have neither political organization, nor offices, nor dignities, nor any authority, for they only obey their chief through the good will toward him. Therefore, they never kill each other to acquire these honors. Also, as they are contented with a mere living, not one of them gives himself to the devil to acquire wealth. End quote. The Jesuits, who proselytized among this society, considered it healthy to beat children into submission, while the Indians considered the practice barbaric. Consider an incident described by Eleanor Burke Leacock in her excellent book, Myths of Male Dominance. A French boy struck and injured a Montagne boy. Alarmed, the Indians demanded gifts. But the French missionaries instead prepared to punish the French child by whipping him in front of the Indians. According to the report of a Jesuit, one of the savages stripped himself entirely, threw his blanket over the child, and crowd out, cried out to him that he was going to do 
that was going to do the whipping. Strike me if thou wilt, but thou shalt not strike him. And thus the little one escaped. When the missionary tried to tell a Montagne Nascapi man that women should love only their husbands so that men could be sure of who their children were, he responded, that Thou hast no sense. You French people love only your children, but we all love all the children of our tribe. The human nature view of the world assumes that humans have a built-in nature shaped genetically by their physical attributes, in the same way that animals have a nature that determines their behavior. The wolf has sharp teeth to tear raw meat, and the bear has fur to keep warm, and fish have gills to breathe underwater, and special muscles adapted for swimming. But we humans have none of these special adaptations. Our peculiar biological inheritance, in particular, our upright gait, larger brain size, opposable thumbs, and the capacity for language, gave us the ability to make tools to manipulate our environment cooperatively and to pass those skills to our offspring. Humans can make fur coats, build shelter, and catch, grow, and cook food, i.e. we can create the things nature did not physically endow us with things that allow us to exploit virtually every environment on the planet. There is a human nature, but what makes us human, language, cooperative labor, and tool-making, are precisely the things that make human behavior so ever-changing and malleable. The point is, what makes humans distinct from other animals, though we are still animals, is that we possess an ability to artificially reproduce our means of existence, a fact which creates a plasticity of behavior that other animals do not possess. In short, we adapt culturally. Human beings have changed relatively little genetically or biologically over the last 40,000 years. Yet our social forms of organization the way that we organize ourselves to procure food, shelter, clothing, and other necessities, have changed tremendously, and in recent centuries at an accelerating rate. It is this that accounts for the changing nature of humans, our morals, our ideas about the world, and about ourselves, from one society to the next. In attempting to attribute extremely variable human behavior throughout history to a relatively fixed constant, a genetically determined human nature, the biological materialists falls into the same trap as the idealists who believe that society is governed by universal ideas and norms. They are both incapable of explaining historical change and evolution. Marx and Engels rejected both idealism and the old static deterministic materialism. If you recall, Marx criticized the French materialists' view that human beings were a product of their circumstances because it was one-sided and left no room for human beings to shape their own history. These materialists always let idealism in the back door in the form of a liberator standing somehow outside society. Marx and Engels' materialism was dialectical. End section.